We're very much looking forward to you. And um, thanks for your coming. We are really totally, yeah, I, I cannot say, we are, we are totally happy that you are here, that you have the time, that you will share us your findings and your, your research with us. And um, yeah, and so um, maybe, maybe you introduced yourself to the group. It's a group of beer sommeliers. So we are uh, having a course. It's about um, 20 weeks um, uh, about learning about beer, all the beer cultures of the world, the history of beer. And so we already talked about what was in what is today Turkey and Syria and Egypt and, and whatever, but um, you are really at the point at the spot. So um, yeah, maybe you introduce yourself and let us take part in your um, research and what you found out. Okay, well, uh, let me first say that uh, uh, it, it really is a pleasure to uh, speak to you today. Um, I, uh, uh, we, I've been very surprised at um, uh, the, uh, the level of interest that we've gotten in this news of our discovery uh, from uh, people in the beer world, in the world of beer. Uh, normally, you know, as, uh, as archeologists, as uh, scholars of ancient history, uh, we're speaking to uh, the academic world. And um, uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to share something of our work uh, with people who have uh, uh, an, uh, both the interest and uh, a very different perspective mm -hmm. uh, on what ancient beer might mean. Um, I'm a, I'm a, a, a research uh, a professor at uh, New York University. Um, I've been working at this particular uh, site in Egypt for, let's see, nearly, uh, it's now 40 years uh, I've been working there, first as a student and for the last 20 years or so as the director of the excavations. Um, and we, uh, uh, only a couple of years ago, began work in this area of the, uh, the ancient brewery. So let me turn to my uh, PowerPoint situation here. Share screen, uh, this one, share, all right. Slideshow. We should begin from here. Uh, so the, uh, uh, we are calling this now Egypt's first royal brewery. Um, and I think that that's an accurate uh, interpretation of what we have. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of background first. Uh, it's located at the site of Abydos, which is you see at the bottom of the satellite map there. Uh, it's about 500 uh, kilo kilometers south of uh, Cairo uh, in the uh, right in the, uh, the, the the area of the Nile Valley where Egyptian civilization developed where it emerged. Um, <clears throat> we were excavating uh, some tombs of the, the age of the pyramids around 2500 uh, BC or so. And we very quickly discovered that under these, there were the remains of something much older and something that looked very different from brick tombs or, or uh, certainly it's not houses, it's not tombs, it's something else entirely. And when we began to work around the, the uh, uh, in the spaces around these later tombs, we could began to see that what we had was a series of very long, narrow 
structures that had been built into the ground, about half a meter uh, into the ground. And they were filled with ceramic, large ceramic vessels, which I've highlighted here, uh, two long rows. Uh, each individual vessel was supported on the outside uh, by a whole series of uh, what I would call fire bars or fire dogs. They're uh, struts of uh, like a long narrow brick against the outside to hold the vessel up uh, when it would be filled with liquid. The, the liquid inside would be very, very heavy, of course. And this was to prevent the vessel from uh, collapsing. Uh, each one of these uh, long, narrow structures was uh, built more or less like this diagram. Two very long uh, rows uh, of as many as 20 of these vats each, uh, surrounded by uh, uh, small uh, walls that held back the sides of the trench in the sand where uh, it was built. This is a cross section to give you some idea. There you see one of these ceramic vessels with its superior, uh, supporting uh, structures on the outside. Now, originally, uh, the whole thing had a roof and the top of the ceramic vessel was a bit higher. It's been broken off, uh, but it looked something like this. And the, the whole interior, this area, uh, everything preserved here is turned red or orange or black from fire. So the whole interior was a giant firebox and wood fuel was used to make this fire. And we, in fact, uh, found some remains of that. And the wood fuel, oh, I should go back one, the orange uh, stripes that you see right there, this is a thick coating of mud on the outside of the, of the, uh, the vessel as to insulate the interior, the contents, from becoming too hot. Uh, I'm, I'm sure all of you are very much aware of the importance of temperature control in uh, production of beer. And this was also the case for the ancient Egyptians. The, the cooking that was done in these uh, structures was low temperature for a long period of time, not very, very hot. We don't know yet exactly what the temperature was, but it was not high enough to vitrify or to melt uh, any of the portions of the structure. So at the point where each one of these arrows is, there was a hole built into the, uh, the side wall for the introduction of the wood for the fuel. So they're putting the wood in every uh, half meter or meter so that the chamber would be completely filled. And here you see the remains of one of these structures and the red arrows show where these holes are located. And we even have quite a lot of charcoal from the wood fuel that's still left uh, inside. But most important from the beer point of view, we have residue in the bottoms of many of these uh, vessels. And this is uh, the, the dregs left over from the production, but it is full of uh, whole and partial grains uh, that demonstrate that the grain that was being used here was emmer not barley. Uh, barley was also used for beer production, especially in later uh, times. But in this particular case, it's pure emmer, wheat, uh, that's being used. 
from from research on uh, beer production later in Egyptian history, we have a, a good idea of the stages of production. Uh, the most recent research uh, suggests that uh, there were there were the grain was separated into two parts. One part was simply uh, ground, mixed with water, and then cooked uh, to make a mash. And this is what we have being done in these big facilities at, from our excavations. The other portion of the grain was uh, sprouted uh, to produce malt. And then the, the enzymes from that uh, would work on the starches that are released in the, the, uh, the cooking process to convert to sugars, which would then be activated, uh, consumed by the yeast uh, that would be introduced, uh, creating fermentation. We don't know yet if the fermentation was done in these vats in our excavations, or if they were done in the jars into which the beer was eventually placed. We're not sure about that yet. This is not the, uh, this is the, the stage that we certainly have. We don't know if the whole stage all the way to fermentation took place in our facilities or if it was done in uh, separate vessels. Abydos is not the oldest uh, beer making known in ancient Egypt. Uh, there are much smaller uh, breweries from a couple of other sites, uh, three or 400 years earlier. This one is from Hierakonpolis, which is uh, some couple of hundred kilometers south of us. Uh, but here, uh, there were five vats. The basic technology is the same. Uh, uh, these are uh, vats in which the mash was uh, heated. And there at the bottom, you see uh, two of these vats. They're, they also are being supported on the outside by these sort of mud uh, struts. And you can see the reddening or the, the, the orange fire discoloration in the upper right, the excavated remains of the uh, brewery. More recently, in the northern part of Egypt, in the Nile Delta, uh, a Polish mission has discovered uh, a contemporary uh, brewery, uh, also three or 400 years older than what we have at Abydos. But again, same basic technology, but much smaller. This is their very nice 3D reconstruction to show you, uh, uh, give you some idea of uh, what that what this originally looked like. It's a bit clearer. So to understand what the Abydos brewery really is, we have to think about, look at what else is happening at the site at the same time. So this brewery dates to around 3000 BC, so around 5,000 years ago. It's exactly at the same time when the very first kings of Egypt, who were from this site, this was their ancestral home, they built their tombs here. And you see the area uh, called the Royal Tombs. Uh, this is being excavated by the uh, German Archaeological Institute since the 1980s. Uh, and these are the tombs of the first 250 or 300 years of Egyptian uh, kings. And those same kings built uh, temples that you see given an outline and labeled there uh, on the edge of the desert overlooking the ancient city or town of, uh, of Abydos. And you can see that the brewery is not far from where these temples are located. One of them is still standing today. They're huge. This covers about uh, 10,000 square meters. Uh, uh, this is a, basically uh, uh, the royal funerary temple where the king's funeral ceremonies took place and offerings were made 
uh, so that the king could have an afterlife and so on. And in and around these temples, we find huge deposits of vessels like this one, uh, numbering in the thousands and sometimes tens of thousands. And each one of these vessels is a beer jar. In other words, each one of these vessels originally contained beer, like was being produced in the brewery a couple of hundred meters away, but the beer has been brought here. The, these jars have been unstoppered, the contents poured out, uh, and then the jars have been discarded and that the discarded jars, that's what we find. We even have depictions from a bit later uh, but also from ancient Egypt, showing pottery jars just like this uh, being filled with beer and then stoppered. Uh, and that's what you see the man sitting down there. He is uh, preparing the jars to receive the beer that's being strained, put through a strainer by the person on the left. So back again to our excavations, you see those long red uh, dotted rectangles, one, two, three, four, five. Those are five of our brewery structures. All that other architecture, these are much later uh, tombs. This is our most recent excavation area where we have number five and number six. And you can begin to see some of the vats uh, there uh, and the, they've, Later tombs and things have cut into these structures, but nevertheless, you can get a sense of the, the scale of things. When we look at what this facility might have produced, if we look at the, the approximate volume of one vat, this would be about 70 liters each vessel. We'll multiply that by 40 and you come up with 2,800 liters per batch in one of these structures. If you, we know that there are eight, we have excavated six and someone a hundred years ago who made the initial discovery but didn't understand what he was looking at uh, saw two more. Uh, so we know that there are eight of these structures. If you do the math, that amounts to a total capacity of 22,400 liters per batch. Now, we don't know if uh, how often a batch was produced. If uh, we do know that fermentation uh, would take place within just one or two days. Uh, and uh, if that took place in the vessel, in the vats themselves in this facility, it means that maybe one batch could be produced per week. So then that could be 50 or 52 batches per year, which is an enormous quantity of beer. Uh, if it was, if the fermentation took place in other vessels, that these vats were emptied, uh, and then ferment bottled, and then the fermentation took place in these other vessels, the beer jars, uh, a batch could be produced almost daily or even daily. Uh, but either way, in ancient terms, this is a gigantic uh, production capacity um, uh, and is, is, uh, and illustrates the the economic power, the wealth, the ability to mobilize labor that the kings of Egypt had right at the beginning of Egyptian history. Now this is contemporary roughly with King Narmer uh, who the later ancient Egyptians credited with bringing political unification uh, to the Nile Valley and creating uh, the early Egyptian state, the first central administration uh, in ancient Egypt. Uh, 
his tomb was at Abydos. Uh, I would I would like to think that this is his brewery, but all we can say right now is they're they're around the same uh, date. But what it means is, from the very beginning of Egyptian history, the the king had the uh, the resources. He had access to the grain, the water, in huge quantities. So he had agricultural produce in huge quantities to produce beer on this scale. And he had the specialized labor to be dedicated uh, to the production uh, under his command right from the beginning. And it's, it's exactly that capacity, that capability that allowed the kings later to mobilize labor on the order of tens of thousands of people to build the pyramids and other huge monuments uh, in, in, that we know so well from ancient Egypt. And next to the pyramids at Giza, a huge city of the, the workers and the administrators involved in the construction of the pyramids is being excavated by an American uh, team led by Mark Lehner. Maybe you've seen it, read about it on uh, in the news or seen something on television uh, about this work. But exactly the, the, this ability to, this logistical capacity, organizational capacity that's exhibited here, uh, our brewery at Abydos brings this right back uh, 500 years earlier to the very beginning of Egyptian uh, history. So, and, and for us, that incredible production capacity, the huge quantities of beer that could be produced here, this really is uh, uh, something completely new, completely unparalleled in ancient Egypt uh, up until now. All the other early sites where we see beer making they, their facilities could produce a few hundred liters, maybe a thousand or 1500 liters, something like that per batch, but nothing on the order of this. So I'll be very happy to take uh, any questions that, uh, or comments that anybody might have. So thanks a lot. Matthew, that was very, very, very interesting and many, many new things and, and very impressive of what, what these old ancient country, culture was capable of. Um, yeah, Holger has a question. Yes, um, thank you, Matthew, also from my side. And um, how, um, in the past, how was the vegetation in, in that area, the emmer and um, the grains come near from, from the the point of brewing or is it, uh, how was the vegetation in that area? Well, the, the, the site is located right on the boundary uh, between the desert and the Nile floodplain, which is the productive agricultural land. So uh, farming still goes on uh, there today. This is still a very uh, rural and agricultural uh, area. Uh, and so it's very likely that uh, the grain that was being used in this brewery was being produced, if not immediately adjacent to the site, at least in the region, uh, stored somewhere uh, uh, nearby. And then uh, these stores were being drawn on uh for the grains or for the grain used in the in the beer production so it's not as though it's being shipped from hundreds of kilometers away likewise with the water uh the brewery itself is in the desert but it's only today it's maybe um uh 75 meters uh from the edge of the floodplain uh, in ancient times, maybe it was 100 meters. Uh, but we know that uh, canals were dug, artificial canals were dug uh, to connect the site to the river. And 
the Egyptians also used uh, small canals for irrigation purposes in agriculture. So bringing a water source nearby uh, would not have been a, a problem either. That would have been readily available. Okay, thank you. And the, the second question is, um, how was the ranking in, in, the, in the culture, in the community? The brewer, was, was, it, what, was he a higher person than the other workers? Or what, what was the ranking? Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, and, and not one that's easy, that's all that easy to answer. Uh, uh, at, at this early time, we don't have the written record to tell us, oh, uh, the brewer so-and-so was paid this much and so on and so forth. Uh, and and uh, uh, individual tombs for people uh, don't have, usually don't have inscriptions to say anything about them. Uh, but in, in later times, uh, uh, brewers uh, uh, had a kind of, um, I, I I, I'm hesitant to use uh, the, the word class, but for, for want of anything better, uh, a kind of lower middle status. But the, the, someone who would be in charge of the brewery, the, the foreman, the supervisor, the inspector, uh, he would have uh, an upper middle uh, position or even higher than that. Uh, so you probably had different levels that were involved in the running of the the uh, the brewery. I mean, if you're if you're producing more than twenty thousand liters of beer every few days, uh, this involves the logistics of bringing in large volumes of grain, large quantities of water, a lot of manpower, uh, supervise keeping track of the materials coming in, the, the finished product going out. Uh, so there are the, the, the brewers who are actually manning the facility itself, and then there, there are the administrators who are keeping track of the movement of uh, materials and the finished product. Okay, thank you. Um, Florian, um, just a second, we have a question from Henri. Um, what did they do with all this beer? Did they drink it or did they offer it or, or what did they do? <laughs> well, the, uh, we know from, from later times that the ancient Egyptians enjoyed uh, beer for the same re reasons that we do today. They like to have uh, to drink, uh, you know, half a liter or a liter or two liters or more, uh, the effects that this would have, they enjoyed this. Uh, and there were, there were even uh, festivals. There was a festival called the Festival of Drunkenness in which people are shown drinking beer and wine and then to the point where they're vomiting and then going back to drinking more. Um, so uh, they certainly valued uh, the, the social or the, um, uh, the, the um, consumption aspect uh, of beer. But in ancient societies like Egypt, uh, beer was also food. Bread and beer are the most commonly referred to uh, foodstuffs in ancient Egypt. Uh, they, were they were both made at the household level for individual families. We know this from archeology. span um, uh, but they were made at an institutional level like this uh, for what you could consider official purposes. In this case, we see these royal temples just a few hundred meters away. And all around these royal temples, we find 
huge piles of thousands upon thousands of used beer containers, which tells us that beer was being used in these buildings for ritual purposes in enormous quantities. Um, I'm sure that some of it was being consumed, but I doubt that it all was, uh, or else people would have died of alcohol poisoning uh, and we would find them laying, laying there, uh, which we do not. Uh, uh, so I would say that the, 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 the primary purpose of this beer production was for use in the rituals in these temples. Okay, thanks a lot. Fl Florian, you also have a question. Yes, um, thank you. Um, is it possible to estimate how uh, many people were employed in this brewery? It could, it could only be a very rough estimate. Um, if you consider the practicalities of putting in the wood fuel, filling the vats, uh, monitoring the airflow, the temperature uh, of, the, of the cooking process, uh, then you've got to empty the material, you've got to mix it with the mal malted uh, grain, uh, bottle it, and so on. Uh, perhaps each individual facility might have had a total team of, let's say, 20 people. Multiply that by eight. So you've got somewhere between 100 and 200 people involved in the beer production, but that's only a very, very rough uh, estimate. I hope uh, once we have completed all of the uh, detailed scientific analyses of the residues, the chemical analysis and the uh, sampling of the yeast and all of these things, I want to try to uh, replicate the production process and recreate this beer. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, and in doing that, we would learn a lot about the practical side of how the production really could have been managed. If you need something to try, the, as I'm going to try the beer, please feel free to contact us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Before Patrick is asking, I also have a short question. Um, sure. I saw on one of your sheets it was written uh, kiln. So was it both a malting site and a brewing site, or was there a mortary separate? Uh, so in the in the uh, that was at uh, uh, the site of Hierocomplus, the the earlier site uh, where beer production is is known. Uh, in that case. Uh, beer brewing and pottery firing, pottery production, both things were happening in the same facility. Both involved firing things. Um, and so both of those uh, uh, types of production are happening there. In our case, it is 100% beer production. Nothing else is happening there. Thanks a lot, uh, Patrick. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, this uh, story of the Egypt culture. That's uh, really, uh, really interesting. Um, could you say, or uh, could we get, uh, could the people at their uh, reward with the beer, they get their money with this or uh, they get the beers? In the in the same time, or which is uh, well, we know we know. Uh, first of all, uh, Egypt did not have money, uh, and so they had no currency, and so uh, everyone was paid in uh, uh, foodstuffs and in materials like cloth or oil or. Uh, wood or metals. Um, uh, so we know from later times that people who worked on official projects uh, were paid 
so much per day in bread, so much per day in beer, uh, so much per week in cloth, and so on and so on. Uh, so it's very likely that a small portion of the beer that was being made here was used to pay the people making it. Uh, but when you're looking at more than 20,000 liters per batch, uh, it would only represent a, quite a small uh, portion of the overall production. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Is there any other question? Boris? Nö, du, du steckst mich ja gleich mit ihm noch in eine Outbreak Session. All right, okay. So, um, so, Matthew, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for being here. Thanks a lot for joining us. We are very, very happy to have you here. And, and It's a great pleasure. <laughs> and all the best for your excavations and for your brewing. Um, 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 now, when, if you try to, to brew the beer <laughs> and we are looking forward to get the recipe and the results and, and being able to try. Um, yeah, and, and maybe we see each other in Egypt. You never know. <laughs> that would that would be terrific. And I, but we'll certainly I'll certainly uh, let you know when the time comes that we're going to uh, try to to make this beer. <laughs>